seats as we turn over to page number 256. 256, are you washing the blood? Once you find your seats, let's stand. Let's sing out, are you washing the blood this evening? Let's stand and sing 256. This evening, Lord, thank for the great message that we heard this afternoon. Thank you for Pastor Allen and just the time that he does pour into the messages for us, Lord. Just pray that um, as we come this evening, Lord, just pray that you prepare my heart, Lord. Uh, cleanse me and uh, just to be, help me to be ready for that, Lord. And just pray that we'd all have that prayer to just be ready to hear from you this evening and uh, just apply something to our lives that we can change, Lord, and move forward. And so we just ask, as we head into the service tonight, that you just bless all aspects of it. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated as we turn over page number six. Page number six, I sing the mighty power of God. Page number six.
Thanks, Thanks Josiah. Steve. Thank you, Stephen, for your awesome playing. Uh, hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Wow, a week's gone by. Like, just, wow, is that happening in your life? Yes. My life is just yes. flying fast. But I don't care because I know where I'm going, right? We know where we're going, and it's forever and ever. Amen to that. Hello to everybody on YouTube Live and Facebook. That's right. There's no lost people there. The Lord has left us here. He could have taken us when we got born again and saved, washed clean of every sin, past, present, and future. He could have taken us, but he, he left us here for a purpose, and that's for us to share our faith. And the Lord, I thank the Lord for reminding me of that this week. I'm like, that's right. Won't be able to share with one person there. So we need to share here. And boy, that really, that, wow, does that encourage me. That makes me want to run out into the street and, 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 and talk to the first person I see. So amen for that. Um, so I think before I get started on my little two or three little things I have, um, I'd like to call it Miss Crystal because she has something to share. So we had an amazing day on Saturday for visitation. Normally I, I, I so that's generally what I do, but I went on the bus route this week and Darianne and I went together, and we got through our whole route, and it was the last house was Cristiano. And the funny thing was, is Darianne and I were both thinking, oh, it's Cristiano, we don't need to go visit him, we'll just call him. And I didn't know she was thinking that, and I was thinking the same thing. I was like, oh, it's getting late. But what the Lord prompted us to do was just to go visit them anyway. And when we got there, his cousin was there from Calgary, and they greeted us at the door, and her name was Sophia. And she was just totally engaged with us saying, I wrote verses down, and I went and soul went to this neighborhood, and I was passing out flyers this morning, and she was telling us all about Jesus and all the things that she knew. And then her grandma came to us and said, she really wants to get saved. Can you lead her to the Lord? Can you tell her about Jesus? And so um, after a few minutes of chatting and getting permission from the parents, we took her outside, and we sat down, and man, it was amazing. She was, because she already knew. She knew she needed to be saved. She didn't know how. And it was awesome. She got saved. She's 10 years old. Trusted Christ as her Savior. And it was so amazing. She's the little girl's on fire for the Lord, and it's so exciting. Um, and just an encouragement to be where you're supposed to be, even when you don't feel like you want to be there. Because it was hot, and I was like, oh, man, it's getting late. We should probably go home. But we went there anyway, and God blessed obedience. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. What, oh, that is so wonderful. So wonderful to hear that. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much to the soul winners who came out on uh, Friday, and that was, that was excellent, uh, Judy and Darianne, and I told them to kind of, you know, it's been on my heart, I, I want you to hear uh, a few of the conversations that we have, um, that I have with people, just to get them encouraged in regards to really taking it to the next level and getting into one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and so we tried our best, but... <laughs> We ended up getting lost, I think, twice there. I kept running up to them, and there you guys are. And, but uh, it still, it was really great. It was so encouraging that they were out there on Friday. And then on Saturday, it was really, really great. I think, I don't know, we had six people, I think. And Saturday was one street in town. And, boy, let me think now. There's two different men I was with the boys. There was two different men that I asked, hey, can I come back another time and, and talk to you another time? And two of them said yes, two different houses. That's kind of rare, because most people go, no, it's good, I'm good. So we're going back. And then there was a lady as well. Um, so we're, we're keeping track of those places that people are, even show the slightest bit interested and they're not affronted and there's no strife and we mark that down um, for opportunity to go maybe in three weeks, two weeks, and go visit them again. And, and you can bet we'll be praying during that time for them. So that was really cool. That was 13th Street. That happened. Um, yeah, downtown. Boy, this is great. What would you guys do? I mean, I know what you would do, but just, wow. So, oh, how'd that work out? I was, yeah, I was on Main Street for quite a while. Went over to the bus, the bus uh, depot there, bus stop. 
and I was handing out tracks to people sitting down right there waiting for the bus, and I think this man was watching me on the next place where you sit down, because I went walking over there, and I've never had anybody say this to me yet, and it kind of stunned me for a second. He, he basically said, okay, uh, tell me all about it. That's exactly what he said. Like just, and I told him, I said, sir, that's like a door you could drive a truck through. And then he was sitting with two other people, and I mean, they didn't seem too interested, but I didn't care. I mean, captive audience, three people right there. So, okay, where do I start? And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to tell him flat out God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you because the Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those, to those that are perishing. So I talked about sin first. And I went through some of the commandments with him to give him an understanding of his need for a savior so that the good news will be good news indeed. And then we got to the God. It was wonderful. The two, there was one lady, she didn't look at me one time, but she was right there listening. And then there was a guy on that side. But boy, did that ever surprise me. You know, just go ahead. What do you got for us? It was, it was great. You just never know what's going to happen downtown. Uh, so yeah, that was downtown. The door knocking was awesome. Um, does anybody have any other testimonies? Did anybody hand out a tract or talk to somebody this week or anything you'd like to share? You've got another one, Miss Chris? Come up here. This is not really about the tracks, but that's okay. I'm just excited about the ladies in the church. Um, a lady came to me uh, the other day and said, "Guess what? I have another friend of mine wants to be discipled." And she just discipled one of her friends who just got saved. And I was so excited by the zeal of the ladies for soul winning in this church. And it was a blessing to me. Yes. Amen. You know what? I totally agree. Because it seems like I find myself, I'm going out with either the ladies or the little kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, come on, man. Let's do it. Let's, let's be an example. So I'll, I'll just go straight into our soul winning verse. It's uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Very famous verse. Absolutely um, very, very pointed verse regarding soul winning. Uh, and here it is. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. This is one to highlight in your Bible, to underline, put a big star. And it's this. And what, it's, it's Paul, in real, Paul encouraging Timothy. And here's what he says. He says this to him, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, and then he tells him how. How do I do those things? Right here, with all long-suffering. In other words, when I'm soul winning, I need to be really patient when people are being self-righteous and when people are not letting me talk and when people are even giving me grief. Right there. Long, I'm going to be long-suffering, and then this part's the best, and doctrine. Always use God's word when you're soul winning. Sometimes I, 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 I do this to people. I hold up my Bible, and I go, after I've shared something with them from God's word, I go, this isn't Daryl Knorr. This is God's word. This is God. This isn't me. And most of the time, people will just, okay, just, just, that just happened on Friday with somebody. I held my Bible. Dude, this isn't me. This is what it says in God's holy word. So all with all long-suffering and doctrine, that really encourages me to continue to memorize verses on evangelism. And just to have that Rolodex going to pick out all of those um, Romans Road verses, and there's a lot of other verses. But, yeah, that's, that's really encouraging. And then our encouragement verse, so that was 2 Timothy 4.2. That's a big verse. It feels weird to kind of just glance over it like that because I'm pretty sure that's a whole message, Pastor, just that, ver <laughs> that verse. <laughs> and if, Yeah, okay, so, um, and then the encouragement verse is, is found in John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16 Verse 33, wonderful, amazingly wonderful verse. And here's what it says. This is Jesus. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me 
ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Brother Lee, I think that's one of your favorite verses. I think you preached on that a while ago. Be of good cheer. I remember you saying that. That is absolutely loaded with encouragement for us as we go through this life. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. That's awesome. Let's stand. Let's turn over to page number 42. What a lovely name. Page number 42. again and uh, this time I actually turned my mic on I went oh no I preached the whole message there so sorry if you were trying to listen online I did go on and and listen to some of the live stream and just turn your volume up really loud and you'll be able to hear praise the Lord <laughs> oh technology oh to be in the days of like George Whitfield man you know as a preacher I wish I had a voice like some of these old timers man now, you ever listen to some of these old timer preachers I don't know, God just gave them a special voice box or something, because I'll tell you what, these guys could, they could preach to hundreds and hundreds of people without any amplification whatsoever, man. They just had this, they had an ability to, to really push back there, but um, anyway, I'm thankful for technology. Um, I gotta tell you, I was sitting up here, you probably thought I was browsing Facebook or something on my iPad, but uh, I was actually... Uh, I was flipping between two messages. Um, uh, really, this afternoon, I, I didn't get to the last point. And, uh, and I'll tell you why, because there were 10 points <laughs> to that last point. And so I thought, I better, I better not do that. And then I had prepared um, from John chapter number 12, and, and I was just asking the Holy Spirit, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, uh, 
and I'm actually killing time still praying over it, but uh, um, <laughs> I, I am. I, I, but, uh, but I think I would like to maybe turn over to Mark chapter 15, if you would. I, and I'm going to share this, this last thought um, from, from the message this, this afternoon, not to try to, um, not necessarily trying to piggyback, but I have been... Um, I guess thinking on this subject a lot, and and really as a as a ministry, structuring things in a way that is profoundly biblical, that there's no mistake as to to who we are, what we believe, the direction we're going in, not trying to muddy the waters. One of my biggest concerns sometimes, especially lately in our independent Baptist movement, and really that's all this is. Some people really get worked up about the term independent Baptist or whatever, uh, but, but really it's just a, it's just a movement, um, and I don't know what it'll be like in 20 years, but, but if I can maybe just use this term in our New Testament Christianity, there's, a, there's been a trend um, happening where it just seems like well, the catch word is to be relevant. And, and, and we try so hard as a New Testament church to be relevant. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to preach kind of on that subject. Uh, and it was the final thought of this afternoon's message on, on really the, the top 10 reasons why I believe we have a younger generation leaving the church. And, and I got to say, uh, the, the actual outline... Um, and some of these thoughts, the, the, the way they're worded are not original to me. It's, it's been a compilation of many things that I have been reading. And yet I believe that as I have sat back and I have thought about conversations that I have had with uh, the millennial generation and, and, and younger, I believe that each one of these thoughts are, are exactly the very issues that as a... And, and I guess I'm old enough now to say as an older pastor, I'm starting to understand more clearly. And, and I hope as Sunday school teachers and ministry leaders and parents that we, that we understand these truths. Because the statistic is that 70%, 70% of our young people are leaving the church after high school graduation. 70%. Some of them make their way back. But the problem is, is many of them make their way back when they get into their 30s and their mid-30s and, and they've had marriages that have collapsed and, and, and families that have been hurt and they realize, man, I, I, you know, maybe that old-time faith that mom and dad tried to teach me, there's something to it. Um, and so I just want to point out a couple of families in, in Scripture that I didn't point out this afternoon. And... And, and help us to understand the importance of, of strong spiritual leadership and really the importance of making a clear sound to a younger generation. And why sanctification, holiness, separation, why being distinctly different from the world is not just some anomaly of what some people would term as those, those well, I have been called a funny mentalist instead of a <laughs> fundamentalist, you know, and I believe that, that we ought to believe and hold to the fundamentals of the faith, but instead we're, we're mocked by, by many, even, <clears throat> even in what they call today this neo-independent Baptist or this new independent Baptist movement. And, and so turn with me, we are in the book of Mark, chapter number 21. Um, notice this in, in verse number 20 and 21. Jesus heading to the cross. He's walking up now to Golgotha. Uh, the Bible says, And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And so Jesus is now walking. This is Mark chapter 15, verse 20. Mark chapter 15, verse 20. Gospel of Mark chapter 15, verse 20. And they're leading Jesus up, and he's about to be crucified, and, and they've mocked him. They've laid on him the purple robe, and, and uh, they're, they're uh, uh, you know, he's, he's walking that, you know, this... Um, to the, to the Mount Golgotha, and look at verse 21. And they compel one, Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, 
to bear his cross. Here's this man, obviously, uh, from everything that I understand, that he, he was not Jewish in his nationality, that he would have been a proselyte. This would have been a, a, a devoutly religious man and, and understood the significance of Passover, understood the significance of, uh, you know, of all of these feasts and that. And, and, uh, and, and I really believe he would have been a, a proselyte. And he brings his two boys along. And, uh, and, they're, and I believe that they're, they're a witness to this. And, and uh, it's interesting that the Bible makes a, a distinction and said, here's Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. I, I find that interesting. Why would the Bible put his boys' names in there? And, um, and as, I, as I began reading, I thought, it, number one, it was wonderful that here's this man who was serious enough about his faith to, to I, I really believe, bring his two boys along. Obviously, he had a great influence in these two young men, Alexander and Rufus. And, and while he's there and he's worshiping and he's, he's interested in Passover, all of this is now transpiring with the crucifixion. And now out of everyone in the crowd, and remember, how many people could have been at Jerusalem during Passover? I made mention. A million people. So a million to one odds. Here's poor Simon walking along, and they're like, you! And he's like, oh, no, I did not want to be called. You, pick up that cross. I mean, and I don't know about you, maybe it's my overactive imagination again. Remember, he has been beaten severely. Uh, Jesus has. He's really beyond recognition. He's already shedding blood. I mean, he is, he is bleeding profusely. From the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says, he sweat as it were great drops of blood. He has been whipped by the cat of nine tails. He's had his beard ripped off his face. He has been beaten by the, by the, uh, by the soldiers. He is probably um, absolutely broken at this point, and he's carrying this cross. And whether that was just the, the cross beam or whether it was the whole cross, I don't know. I don't think it makes that big of a difference. The point is it, uh, that, that Jesus was being crippled under the weight of this cross. And, and he literally could not go any further. His body was so broken that, uh, that this man comes by and he picks up this, cr this, this cross. And, and can you imagine um, Simon's horror of this severely beaten uh, man named Jesus and he picks up this cross and he maybe lays it over his shoulders and now he is literally uh, uh, stained with the blood of Jesus. And he, and he takes this cross and he, and he bears it up and, and, uh, um, and of course Jesus is crucified. And now notice the book of Romans chapter number 16. Romans in chapter number 16. So turn over the book of Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Paul writing back, and, and uh, he's writing here to the, to the Roman Christians, and, and perhaps, um, uh, and, he's, and he's saluting. So, you know, he's saying, verse number 9, salute, or basically say hi to Urbane, our helper in Christ, and, and Stashes, and Apelles, and, and uh, all of these guys. Notice verse number 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. I don't know what happened to Alexander um, or Simon. It, it, without making too much presupposition on the text, it, it, it is interesting that perhaps by this time Simon and Alexander, maybe they were off the scene, I don't know. But it seems very clear to me that this, this Rufus, I believe, uh, uh, very well could be the same Rufus that we read about in the book of Mark, uh, Simon's son. And, and we see, I believe, a, a generational passing of the torch. And, and here Simon uh, is carrying this cross, his two boys, Alexander and Rufus. Now we read about Rufus again here in, in Romans chapter 16. And, and I thought, boy, how important it is for us as, as parents, as spiritual leaders, as adults, to be able to effectively pass the torch to the next generation. I made mention of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul, writing again to his son in the face, Timothy, he said, you know what? Uh, basically, he was thanking, really, I believe he was thanking the Lord for, uh, uh, for Eunice and Lois, the grandmother and, and mother of Timothy, who instilled biblical truth into Timothy. And uh, despite being from a broken home, sometimes people think that, that all Christians come from perfect homes. Timothy certainly didn't. And yet he was a great preacher of the gospel and the pastor there at Ephesus, I believe. But two women, a grandmother and a mother, can I encourage you in this? 
Maybe you find yourself today in that situation. Oh, I tell you what, if you stay faithful to the things of God, you have no idea, you have no idea what God can do with the life of that child. But there was obviously a clear communication of the faith because later on in 2 Timothy, Paul writing again to this son of faith, he says this, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which were able to make thee wise unto salvation for all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for instruction, right? All of these things to the end that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Here we have two different families inside of the New Testament who communicated the faith to the next generation. And we find here that, that Paul is saying, hey, make sure you say hi to Rufus for me. Still going on for the Lord. And Timothy being a direct result of, of Eunice and Lois. And as I thought about this generational passing of the torch and this generational um, uh, shift that we make, why is it that, that many, many times inside of our churches... We're losing that generation. And if we're not losing them completely, maybe them leaving the church completely, that, that somehow <clears throat> we're failing to communicate the, 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 the really the unadulterated truths of God's word. And, and we, try to, we try to dress up a 2,000-year-old faith into to some modern pragmatic uh, look of the gospel. And we spend more time in our churches trying to look like, dress like, sound like the world than we do simply communicating this beautiful old-time faith that we have been instructed to communicate to the next generation. And we sit back, we go, man, our, our ideas aren't working, our ideas aren't working. Well, let's try this, let's try this. I believe that's important for us as a church and as parents to say, you know what, maybe we're trying too hard to be something that God never intended us to be. Maybe we just need to come back and say, how did the New Testament church do it? And let's just do church that way. And amen, you can put whatever these are, 50-inch TVs, and, and put words up there. Amen, you can use technology. You know, we can, we can use different means, right? Right? But I think it's important that we understand that, that we're in an existential crisis inside of our churches concerning a next generation. And why is this? Well, again, as I've done much reading and, and really, really meditating upon this, I, I have to say again that perhaps not all of this um, uh, is, is uh, that, that I've gleaned a lot from other writers, and, and I'm preaching a little bit topically today, and I understand that. But every single one of these 10 reasons I'm going to give you, I have dealt with in the last year. Yay, the last six months. Why are we losing a generation to the world? I believe number, the first reason I want you to see is that we try to make church relevant. You go, wait a minute, I, I think I misheard you. I think you said church is irrelevant. No, you, you heard me correctly. We are trying so hard to make church relevant. The author says here, we've taken a historic 2,000-year-old faith, dressed it in plaid and skinny jeans, and tried to sell it as cool to our kids. Now, if you ever saw me in a pair of skinny jeans, you'd never come back. <laughs> we've tried to sell church as cool, but it's not cool. What is cool about being fed to lions? What is cool about being burnt to death? What is cool about being thrown into prison? What's cool about being martyred? Like, what is cool about that? But that's New Testament Christianity. No, we don't see it here in North America, and praise God, I really don't want my kids to face that. But they are in Iran. They are in China. They are in many Muslim countries. So why is that cool? Why are we trying to take something that, that literally every single day Christians are being martyred and put to death? Why are we marketing that in North America as let's be cool? It, it really, it's really mind-boggling to me. It's not modern. The Christian faith was never meant to be modern. It didn't say, let's make biblical Christianity and let's keep modernizing it. No, actually the Bible says that we ought to stick to the old paths. But no, we've tried to do, we're marketing church 
as being something it fundamentally can never be. I love how one uh, quote says it. He says, when the ship is in the ocean, everything is fine, but when the ocean gets into the ship, you're in trouble. And I think it's very true. Hey, we're called to be, we're, we're in the world, are we not? That is a ship in the ocean. We are in the world. But we are not to be of the world. That's the ocean getting into the ship. So why are we trying so hard in youth group and, and, in, and in ministries and in church to try to put the ocean into the ship? I mean, that's so counterintuitive. That's like going out boating and taking buckets of water out of the lake and pouring it into your boat. <laughs> All you're going to do is sink your ship. And again, I'm not ranting about worldliness per se. But I'm talking about a fact that, that we've raised a generation that after a five-minute biblical text, ugh, and it's not just because we do church at two in the afternoon. And yet, we can find ourselves fawning over some celebrity or some athlete who makes some vague shadowy reference to Christianity. Oh, how many of us, and I'm not going to knock anyone, but how many of us, you know, you get enamored with, you know, oh, Tim Tebow, yeah. How about Paul? How about Peter? How about Jesus? You know, and praise the Lord for their faith, and they took a stand for faith, and, and, and don't, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Is I'm like, we're just trying too hard to be relevant when the Bible calls us to be a peculiar people, zealous on the good works. That means we're to be different. Well, pastor, you're just, you're just a little old school. I mean, um, you, you know, here, here, here's where our younger generation goes. Where does it ever say in the Bible you got to wear a tie to church? You're missing my point. <laughs> you're missing the point. No, the Bible doesn't say to wear a tie at church. I get it. In the Philippines, they wear a barong. But my point is, why are we looking for any excuse to be more like the world rather than just holding the line and saying, you know what, I want to maintain a difference from the world? Because you don't see our politicians saying, I wonder why we have to wear a tie to parliament. They do it because of the respect of the place they're going. So why have we minimized the church and let's, well, let's just make church relevant and yet we can go all sorts of other places. I mean, geez, even the hockey players show up to their silly games in a suit and tie in Armani suits. Do they not? Do they not? So if it's good enough for the NHL, why is it, why is it all of a sudden, well, you're just pietistic because you wear it to church? Do you, do you understand the spirit? I'm not, and, and, and I hope I'm not coming across caustic. I'm just really passionate about this. I'm like, why are we trying so hard to be relevant? And we miss the whole point of the gospel and how it's supposed to change our lives. I don't want to be relevant. I mean, I don't want to be archaic. I mean, I get it. I don't like brown. We, we can have something other than brown carpet. And that's not being evangelical. <laughs> I'm just, let's not market the Bible to be something that it was never designed to be. And let's just stick to the historic faith. I believe another reason why our kids are leaving the church in droves is because they've really never attended church to begin with. You go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, I don't understand what you mean. The authors, some of the authors, and this one author's name's Mark, that I read, it was, it was kind of funny. He said, we go from Noah Ark-themed nurseries to Jumbotron summer campus kids to pizza parties, rock concerts, and everything else. And we do everything else rather than doing what church is all about. And by the way, I'm not against, I'm not against these things. I'm really not. But I'm just making a point. Is, is, is we, we, we kind of, we coddle them through the kid into the teen years and all of a sudden, they're out of the youth group, and now they got to come to church, and they don't even know what it means to sit through a, a, a okay, in my case, a 40 to 45 minute message, which I grew up at an hour and 10 minutes, no less. And then we can't figure out why we can't transition them from the teen group to church life. 
You know what I said to a young preacher boy? And I said, when you're going to get ready to preach the teens and kids, preach. Preach at them. Preach. Don't, don't, you don't, you don't have to stick with, with these, with these, with a cotton candy message. Preach. Put some study and effort and preach to teens and kids as though you're preaching to a bunch of preachers. Because isn't that what we're trying to raise? Are we not trying to raise future missionaries and pastors and and Christian servants? So let's preach at them. Let's show them who God is. Let's show them that we've spent more than 10 minutes on a Saturday preparing a lesson, and let's put some meat and grit back into things. And by the way, that doesn't start at the church. It starts at home. And all I'm saying is, is they left the church because they don't even know what it means to be in church anymore. I don't know if my, I don't know if they'll really like that. No, they probably won't because, because if they're anything like my house, I find it amazed. I always tease Stephen, not, not I'm picking on Stephen or my kids. It's like, you ever, you ever watch these? I mean, they could be on their phone with headphones, with headphones on headphones, playing and watching shows. And I'm just like, how do you not go into like epileptic fits over that? Like, how do you even like way too much auditory and stimuli coming into one brain? You know that the the, the average goldfish, they say, has a longer attention span than most kids today. Truly. Because the flashing of the screen and entertainment and all this stuff, it changes. I'm going to encourage you, and I know I'm really proud of all of our, 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 our leaders because I believe that we do this. I really do. I really believe that you guys do a great job at this. But can I encourage you in something? Preach. Preach. Give them the hard truths. Give them something to eat. So that when they get out into an atheistic, secular, skeptical world, they can say, actually, my Bible says this, and I've seen it played out in my life. I've seen it played out in my family's life. They leave because they don't even know what it means to attend church. They leave because they actually get smart. It's not that our students got smarter when they left home. Rather, someone actually treated them like they're intelligent. And what I mean is, is we spend so much time with the milk of the word that we actually don't challenge their deeper thoughts. And we, 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 we kind of, and I, I believe it, in our education system that we treat kids like they're dumb. It's like they don't know how to do math anymore. All of a sudden, something happened where that grade six stuff I was learning in grade 6 math, they're now learning in grade 12, it seems like. And I'm like, what happened? Like, did, did all of a sudden we get, you know, less smart? But we've seen it in society. All of a sudden in our churches, we, 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 we don't really challenge their thinking. We don't really encourage them to think critically. We, we spoon-fed sometimes so much instead of getting into the deeper things of God's Word and really challenging their thinking concerning what are your convictions, where are your standards, what do you believe, all of a sudden they get on into university and they're actually challenged to think deeper about things, but the problem is they're thinking deeper about atheism and humanism and secularism rather than biblical Christianity. And they have no idea how to think critically concerning their faith, which is why on Sunday afternoons at 1 p.m. for the last six weeks, I've been trying to instill how do we earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It's astounding to me that Christians have been in the Lord for 20, 25 years. They, They couldn't even tell you where the Great Commission is. Because we teach on self help messages all the time. How to be a better you, says Rick Warren, right? And Joel Olstein and all these guys. Again, I'm not, again, please don't misunderstand my spirit. I'm just saying, when are we going to challenge our young people to think a little critically? To actually use the intelligence that God gives them. Because we treat them, I think sometimes we, we treat them that, that somehow, you know, they, they're just not able to understand that. Which leads into number seven, that we send them out, then we send them out into the world completely unarmed. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't defend the existence of God with a kindergarten. So all of a sudden, Professor Atheist stands up at university and spouts off some, some ad hominem, uh, circular, logical reasoning, and our, and our kids stand there just absolutely gobsmacked going, oh, 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 oh. And all they remember
remember is some worship leader going, Jesus loves you, and he loves me too, and he loves you too, and he loves me too. And for 45 minutes, they just wave their hands in the air and pump out dry smoke. The preacher gets up, preaches on how you can have a better life today, and they know nothing about the, 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 the truths and the fundamentals of the faith where they can say, actually, Mr. Atheist, have you considered that nothing cannot produce something and give them real substance where they can look at that Mr. University teacher. We've jettisoned discipleship and we've sold them on deeds, not creeds. We've encouraged them to, to start the quest to find God's plan for your life. And, and I know that we have a what do we believe tab on our website. But is that actually being reinforced? And, I, and again, I'm glad here it is. I really do. I believe we're doing, a, we're doing as best we know how to equip our young people in the faith. But I'm here to tell you that's not true in the average evangelical church. It's astounding to me that we don't teach the faith and then, what's even more surprising, is we're surprised why they leave them the orthodox historic faith of our fathers. And we can't figure it out. We can't figure it out. I believe another reason why, and, and I like how this author puts it, he says, we've given them hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs. <laughs> You've tried your best to pass along the internal subjective faith that you feel. Oh, sometimes I literally, I just want to... Crystal goes and, you know, fills the, the dents in the drywall from my forehead. <laughs> like, why do, we, why do we have to feel everything? I'm not talking about being emotionally stagnant. That's not what I'm getting at. I just don't feel like it. Well, I'm just not feeling it today. I'm like, I'm sure Paul didn't either as he's traveling to Corinth or from Berea after being beat up and stoned. I'm sure he didn't feel feel it. Yeah, I'm a good rock. Man, hit me hard. Yeah. No, I bet he was hurting after he got stoned to death, right? I just thought you guys were sleeping, that's all. I mean, do you think Paul felt it every day? I mean, didn't he say, he said, I'd rather be with Christ. He said, nevertheless, it's more needful for me to abide with you. I mean, do you think these Christians who actually face real serious persecution, they feel it? Probably not, all the time at least, but they know what is right. And by the way, doing what is right is not based upon your feelings. It's based upon truth. And we have been fed in our public schools that truth is somehow subjective, and the church has bought into it. They bought into it. You know what pragmatism is, right? Pragmatism, if it feels right and it seems like it works, then it must be truth. That's pragmatism. And by the way, just because something works at some mega church may or may not make it right or wrong, but it may not be the, 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 the means by which we need to do and, 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 and be involved in ministry here. Pragmatism is, is the death blow to a thriving, energetic, passionate Christian ministry. You can't hand down this type of subjective faith with nothing to solid for, for our kids to hang it on. Um, I, just, I, just, I just met someone and they said, you know, they, you know praise the Lord, they found another, uh, another home to worship in and, and I'm thankful for it. And, and that's fine. And I gotta be careful how I say this. I don't wanna, again, I, please, I hope you understand my spirit. But, but they, they felt that the music was better. And that's fine. You know, that's fine. But it just made me sit back again. I'm like, is that really what, is that what our faith has come to? The entertainment? Is that what it's come to? I'm just not feeling it? And then we can't figure out why we're losing our young people because they don't feel it in church. How about it, how about, how about this? Let's, let's think less about our feelings because our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful anyway. And let's come back to the historical fundamentals of the faith and say, what does God say on this? 
and I feel good when I do right in God's eyes. That's what makes me feel good. I may not feel good in the process because it takes some discipline, and it just takes a little bit of... I tease with our... We have an admin meeting at 6 a.m. I don't feel it every 6 a.m. i got to tell you. The three ladies I meet with, they're fine with it. Jackson and I, we're like, where am I? How did I get here again? What time is it? Amen? It's t- Josiah, he's pretty, he's a morning guy too. He does pretty good. Jackson gives me his best ideas about 7.30 in the morning. It's taken him an hour and a half to kind of let that Java work through his system. I'm not feeling it. But why do we, why do we hand down to our kids a subjective faith based on feelings rather than, as Jeremiah said, I love it, that it's a nail in a secure place. Don't you love that phrase? It's beautiful. Number five. Why, why are we, what, what's, what's another reason why we're, we're, we're losing a generation? It's the word community. And this is an interesting one. You notice this word is everywhere in the church since this, what they call the seeker-sensitive church growth movement came on the scene. And, and, and there's a reason and, and a driven philosophy behind it. And when our kids leave home, um, they leave the manufactured community that we've built. Because we've turned church from a participant sport to a spectator sport. I'm a big proponent of getting kids involved and getting teens involved in ministry. Mm-hmm. Oh, they make a mess of things. They really do. It's like working with kids around the house. You know, have the kids plant the garden, only half the garden comes up because most of the seeds just fell on the surface anyway. But you know what? They need to know what it means to get their hands dirty. And we've built this manufactured community and they live where their faith is something they, they do just inside of that community. And, and, and they really, you know, they don't know how to, to then take this gated community and take it out into the real world. Um, <laughs> one author said it like this. With their faith as something they do in community, they soon find that they can experience this life change and life improvement in community in many different contexts. Mix this with a subjective pragmatic faith and the 100th pizza party at the local Big Spock church doesn't compete against the easier, more naturally appealing choices of other communities. And we are looking for communities rather than a biblical New Testament Bible preaching community. Because they want that feeling again. They want that community rather than something that is, that is, that is solidly based on truth. So they left the church And number four, they found better things. And they found better feelings. Rather than an external objective historical faith, we've given our youth an internal subjective faith. The evangelical church isn't discipling or teaching our kids the fundamentals of the faith. They're simply encouraging them to be nice and love Jesus. And that's nice. And we ought to be nice. And we ought to love Jesus. But what does that mean? When they leave home, they realize that they can be spiritually fulfilled and get the same subjective self-improvement principles, the warm and fuzzies, from the latest life coach or from spending time with friends or volunteering at a shelter. And that becomes their community. And they can truly, uh, and they can be truly authentic and they jump at the chance. And why do they jump at that chance? Why, why is this, is that as, as they're finding better feelings, because they really, and again, all it boils down to is are we giving them something that they can truly hang their hats on? That they can truly say, here's what God says on the matter. Here's how we can ground our lives and not be a double-minded man who's unstable in all their ways. Because, you know, they've been told to love Jesus, but they've also been told that, that in this pragmatic world that, you know, if, if it's not really comfortable, then maybe that's not what the Lord wants you to do, rather than saying, you know what, by faith I'm going to launch out and I'm going to trust God recklessly to do a work in my life and in my heart. But instead, we do want plaid and skinny jeans and Starbucks inside of the church, and then the real world hits. And they find these better feelings somewhere else. And, and honestly, many of our kids, number three, another reason why they, 
working from 10 down to 1. Why they leave the church is they simply, our, our kids get tired of pretending. They get tired of pretending. I've got this funny meme I'm looking at. It's the, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory guy, and he's, he says this. So you're a Christian, and walk away from anyone who doesn't serve you, grow you, or make you happy. Tell me again how Jesus died for you while you were his enemy. <laughs> you, you know, um, this, this best life now every day is Friday Christianity. That's what we're marketing. And the fact is, is I don't have my best life now. My best life is after. <laughs> if this is my best life now, I'm in big trouble. Like serious trouble. And guess what? Every day is not like Friday. I'm finding lately most days are like Mondays. And it's just gritty, and it's hard, and it's messy. But a just man falls seven times and gets up again. Really, that's the truth of, of biblical Christianity. There's little room for struggle or doubt. Turn that frown upside down, move along. Kids who are fed a steady diet of, of, uh, of sermons aimed at removing anything or anyone who doesn't pragmatically serve God's great plan for your life. Anyone read in scripture of anyone who had kind of the life that most evangelical churches preach, like you're going to be problem free? Because I really wish that were the case. Like that would be really nice. But the fact of the matter, it's just not true. Paul didn't have this walk in the park kind of Christian journey, did he? Peter didn't. James didn't. Titus didn't. Timothy didn't. The martyrs of the faith didn't. Christians in Iran don't. Christians in China don't. Christians in Sri Lanka don't. Christians all over these creative access countries. They don't have that kind of walk. The only countries that I can think of that have that kind of walk are North American Christians and maybe some European countries. But basically, European countries have gone completely humanistic and secular. We're the only ones. Most real dedicated Christians know that if I do this, I could possibly die. Most of our teens, it's like this one kid I watched as YouTube influencer. They drive me nuts. He's all oh, crying. We shouldn't teach World War II in our schools because somehow it hurts people's self-esteem. How about that's really the brutal truth of the world in which we live? You know? The Christian life isn't easy, but it's blessed. And it's awesome. And I wouldn't want it any other way. Because you never know what you're capable of until you're pushed. You never know what, what God can do with the life until they're stretched to the very max, until they come to the very end of themselves, and they say, you know what, God, I can't go any further. And he says, finally, I can take you the rest of the way. And that's biblical faith. That's what our kids need to understand. Our generation needs to understand that, you know what, when you go to school and you try to share your faith, they're going to laugh at you. But hey, take heart because they're not rejecting you. We're going to look in John chapter 12 next week. They're rejecting Christ. And that's what Jesus said. They're not reject. Jesus said this. They're not rejecting me. They're rejecting the Father and the word I speak on behalf of my Father. And the word that they reject is going to be the very thing that judges them in the day of judgment. Why are kids leaving church? Why are our kids leaving church? Because they're tired of pretending. They're trying to look for this empty feeling that just doesn't exist rather than cold, hard, foundational truths. They're tired of pretending. Why do kids leave? Why are we losing this other generation? Because they know the truth. They can't do it. They know it. All that be nice moralism they've been taught. The Bible has a word for that. I just taught it through in my discipleship class this afternoon. It's called the law. That's what they're trying to live. If I can just do this, be nice, do this, do this, do this, then I will be the good Christian. And we've, we've, we've not taught them, we've not taught them how to live in the power and the working of the Holy Spirit of God. We've taught them that if you can, if you can do these 10 things, and man, you got this thing called Christian down. Rather than saying, let me tell you what it means to learn to walk and to be, to be led of the Spirit of God. That's so important. Do's and don'ts are lists of this and that. 
oh, but I'm telling you what, we need to, we need to fill their minds with Bible principles and convictions and teach them how to think through things. And, 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 you know, whatever, whatever it might be. And challenge them. So why do we listen to the music we listen to? Why don't we watch these movies? Why don't we go to these places? Is it just a denominational checklist of do's and don'ts? Or are, some, are, are, are there some convictions? Man, I've met teenagers. I've met young adults. They couldn't tell you any Bible principle on what they should watch. You know what they say? Well, I just, I just don't feel that way. Could you give me a Bible verse? Well, you know. They couldn't tell you why, why someone ought to dress modest or immodest. They did, I don't know, this is kind of what I do. Or they'll say something like this. Well, the Bible doesn't say, well, good job. Yes, good. Yeah, so let's live our entire Christian life on what the Bible doesn't say. Because we know that's real faith. Huh? How about find something the Bible does say on the matter? Because are we not to live our lives based upon the word of God? Right. So why have we raised a generation who simply says, well, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Okay, thank you, theologian. Could you find what the Bible does say on this matter? Because if the Bible transcends time and culture, does not the Bible have something to say on it? Or is the Bible old-fashioned, outdated, and we should just throw it away because it's, after all, as Justin Trudeau said in, what, 2018? Um, well, after all, it's 2018. And that was his answer to a question on why he chose the cabinet he chose. How about because these are the most qualified intellectual people I could find, and they are absolutely perfect for the job because they have proven themselves to be dedicated. No, you know what he said? Because it's 2018. I mean, are you kidding me? You just degraded all of these super smart human beings, even though I may not be of their political persuasion, by just saying, I just chose them because it's 2018. But that's the Christianity we're living in. Why do they do it? Oh, well, it's 2022, Pastor. I mean, come on, we don't do that anymore. Could you show me then? Because I'm willing to change if you can give me some cold, hard Bible principle. Because here's the truth of the matter, is I could show you why I believe and why I practice what I practice here at Okanagan Valley Baptist Church. And I, people get mad at me and leave the church, but they couldn't give me one lousy scripture reference. I sat with people, and I said, well, the Bible says this. I know you have a Bible verse, but... I'm like, well, then give me your Bible verse! Like, just let's intellectually communicate differences and standards rather than just saying the Bible doesn't say... But this is what we're transmitting to the next generation, and this is why they're leaving the church. And so parents, the next time you make a rule or a, or a, a, or, or a standard in your home, you say, hey, actually, here's what the Bible says concerning it. And I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but, but this is what I really believe the Bible says. And then live it. And better they be mad at you for at least being able to, to give a Bible principle concerning rather than just on a whim. 70% of our young people are leaving the church because of a shallow, jumbotron, cotton candy church ministry we feed them. And I like to have fun. I do. I did get a pie in the face. I have drank three raw eggs because I've lost a competition. Crystal has eaten goldfish twice. <laughs> like, fun is okay, amen? <laughs> That's not fun. <laughs> it's fun for the crowd. But what I'm saying is, is they find out after all of this, because we've, 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 we've given them nothing to stand on, this is the conclusion, and here's the number one reason why I think young people leave the church, is they simply don't need it. And it comes back to why I was so maybe emphatically passionate concerning the need for local church ministry is because we do need it. We do need it. But what we've marketed is something that they could go to any place they want and get the same feeling rather than knowing right and wrong, good and evil, Bible principle compared to the Bible doesn't say, or I'm simply not convicted about it. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder. You murder. Well, it didn't make me feel bad. 
Well, does that, the fact that you feel no remorse over a, 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 an act against God, does that, it, does that really determine right and wrong, whether, how we feel about the action? Or shouldn't our feelings be based upon what is right and wrong in the eyes of God? Since when do we become the emotional authority on, on the things of God? So they find out that they don't need it. Why do I need church? I get the same kind of feeling so long as I do good, give charitably to the poor, I can still go to the hockey game, I can still go to the football game, I can still go do what I want with my friends and feel okay because I gave to the, I gave to the homeless guy. And you know what? That's like being like Jesus. He gave to the poor. And yet Jesus said... The poor you have always, but me, not. Our kids are smart. They've picked up on the message we've unwittingly taught. The church is simply a place to learn life application principles and achieve a better life and community. You don't need to be crucified. You don't need to crucify Jesus for that, by the way. I could teach that in, the, I can teach that in the public school. Really, I, 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 could teach, I could teach kids life principles that will make their life community better. They really don't need to crucify Jesus to learn those principles. But we need to crucify Jesus to take us to heaven, to learn what it means to walk a spirit-filled Christian life, to be able to have some guts and some courage and some boldness to say, thus saith the Lord, not just what my particular denomination says. Why would they get up early on a Sunday to watch a cheap knockoff of an entertainment venue? There's, there's, there's better rock bands to listen to than the church band. Half of them can't even sing on key. I've been to a few. What, what, why, why go through all of that? I could, I could, go, to, I could, I could, I could go to a Justin Timberlake. I could go to, a, I could go to another concert to get that, and it makes me feel better anyway. That's what we, they, they learn that. As a pastor, this is, <laughs> I just laugh. You know, it's the middle-aged pastor trying desperately to be relevant to them uh, <laughs> would be a comical cliche if it weren't so devastating. You know, these, the, the, you know, where they got the, you know, they got to wear their buttons down to here with their chest hanging out, and I'm going to teach to you by it. It's just like, oh, dude, seriously. <laughs> Come on. They put buttons on that thing for a reason. As we've jettisoned the gospel, our students never hit with the full impact of the law, their sin before God, their desperate need for the atoning work of Christ. Now, let me tell you that that's relevant, that's authentic, and that's something the world can never offer. We've traded a historic, objective, faithful gospel based on God's graciousness toward us for a modern, subjective, pragmatic gospel based upon achieving our goal by following life strategies. Rather than being faithful to the foolish simplicity of the gospel of the cross, we've set our goal on being quote-unquote successful in growing crowds with this gospel of glory. This new gospel saves no one. Our kids can check all the boxes with any manner of self-help life coach or simply design spiritualism. And they can do it more pragmatically successful in the more relevant community. They leave because given the choice with the very message we've taught them, and they find that going somewhere else seems to be the better choice. Our kids leave because we have failed to deliver to them the faith delivered unto the saints. I wish it wasn't a given, but when we present the law and the gospel to these kids, many times the response is the same. I've never really heard that before. And again, I'm not against entertaining and having fun. I'm just saying, guys, we have failed sometimes in reaching the next generation because we have failed to reach them with the word of God. So can I encourage you parents? Can I encourage you Sunday school teacher? When the world says, let's try to be more relevant, maybe just look at them and say, let's try to be more biblical. Let's stop feeding our teens with things the Bible doesn't say. And let's start feeding them with what the Bible does say. Let's teach our teens, let's teach our youth, let's teach our children how to build 
biblical convictions and standards in their life. Not that they might be holy or pietistic in their thinking, but they, they may be humble servants of God, understanding that they are condemned sinners, alienated from God, and the only merit they have is because a loving Savior died for the gross, disgusting sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Let's teach them what it means to live a spirit-filled life. You know what that's going to mean from you and I? We're going to have to live the spirit-filled life. We're going to have to live out this book day by day. And you know what? We're not going to be perfect. It's going to get messy. It's going to be tough. But you know what? That is something historically that a generation can hold to. Why are our kids leaving the church? Because we've offered to them Kool-Aid rather than the cross. And let me just say this. I am proud of the leadership of Okanagan Valley Baptist Church. For those that are new to the church, those that are maybe watching that are newer to the church, you're not going to find any better group of teachers that have a desire to instill biblical truth in the kids and have a little fun along the way. Then I believe the, the people here at Okanagan Valley Baptist Church. Now, I know I'm a little biased. But you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing some kids that, that are understanding some things about God, the nature of God, and the work of God that you're just not going to get somewhere else. And I'm thankful for it. Teachers, keep it up. And don't get discouraged. And when you go into that teen class, teen leader, they don't need a canned message. They need to hear from God, and they need to hear something that God has put burning upon your heart that you've studied and you feel passionate about. It's the same in discipleship. It's the same everywhere we go. Let's not lose another young person to the cancer of pragmatism, and let's preach Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for this night. I really wrestled. And yet, Lord, I believe this is exactly what you would have for us. And, and maybe I need to be reminded because... Lord, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what else to do than just to lift up and preach Jesus Christ in this book. God, help us to be men and women of conviction. Father, help us not to fall into the trap of a jumbotron, pragmatic church ministry. But God, help us. God, help me to boldly proclaim the truth of your word so that we might hear when we reach heaven's shores, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we love you tonight. And I pray your power and I pray your blessing. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Maybe with Stephen here. Stephen, why don't you come on up? Let's just have a quick invitation time. Maybe God's put something upon your own heart and mind, maybe as a mom, maybe as a dad, maybe as a Sunday school teacher. And maybe we need to renew our commitment to just saying, Lord, I don't know how to do it all, but I simply want to live the book. We're going to sing, um, I don't know, can we find Is Your All on the Altar? Can we find that hymn? And Stephen, do you know that? Can you play that, Is Your All on the Altar? And maybe we need to leave something on the altar tonight. Maybe we found in our homes or in our ministry we have slipped into something that is just profoundly, profoundly shallow. And let's just maybe spend a couple of verses in, in introspection and invitation and let the Lord have his way. And so this song is your all on the altar. What about you today? This is in 296. What about you?
being here this evening, and I hope to see you on Wednesday, and uh, continuing down through the series, meditating through the Psalms. We're going to look at Psalms chapter 5, Psalms chapter 6, and I do hope that that'll be a blessing to you. In the meantime, I hope you go with God's blessings. Have a great week and uh, enjoy all this sunshine. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is good to be here. I thank you for, I thank you for this church. I thank you for um, each one of the, the teachers. Um, God, I pray that you encourage them. They're doing a good job, and I thank you for it. Uh, Father, I pray for our respective ministries. God, help us never to fall into the trap, but help us to be humble. Help us to just, uh, just to preach Christ and him crucified and and, uh, and just give great encouragement and strength. I know some are hurting today, and they're just going through a battle. They're going through some storms. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you'd, be encur- uh, that you'd encourage and strengthen these that are downhearted, and uh, we'll thank you for it. It's in Christ's name we pray, and for your glory. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>